Crucible, Arthur Miller, uh-huh. uh, Witchcraft. Yep. Uh, well, witch uh, trials. Witch trials yeah. that were a uh, not so thinly veiled metaphor for the McCarthy here. Exactly. At yeah. the time of the McCarthy. And I played an old man. I was I played an old man named Giles Corey who uh, is accused of being a witch and is stoned to death. So that was very funny for me and my friends. That my friend Al McIntosh played the judge who had uh, who gets to sentence me to stoning to death and. We laughed. I think we did five performances. We laughed every time. Cause During he, the performance? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> I mean, it was absurd. I had uh, baby powder in my hair to make me look like right. I had, Yeah, it was... Now, tell, please tell me this was a third grade play. No, it wasn't. This was high school. This was... <laughs> I'd love to if the Crucible was being done in an elementary that school. That would be amazing, yeah. Has anyone tried that? That sounds like something that you might uh, try to do. I just, I'm pitching that idea to you. It's sort to... of Rushmore, isn't it? Oh, I guess that's yeah. true. But uh, even younger, did yeah. they do that in Rushmore? How old? I mean, they were like little kids, I think. I mean, oh, shit! So I gotta West... watch. Yeah, well, you should pitch Rushmore. Right <laughs> again, <laughs> yeah, again, just to retitle it mm-hmm. and maybe pitch it to actually pitch it to Wes Anderson. Right, that would be great. Are you a Wes Anderson fan? I am. I can't. I can't say I'm not. I enjoy. Actually, I I've liked all his movies less. He's sort of like uh, M Night Shyamalan in some respects. Where like I me and Bottle Rocket is one of my favorite movies, right. and it gets more and more. Uh, Wes Anderson each time, you know, and some people really like that. Yeah, but I think that the uh, the career trajectory, the arc, mm-hmm. is is, is completely up. opposite. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, yeah. If you were to look at a graph, right. of Wes Anderson and F. Yeah. Night Shyamalan, la, 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 yeah, it's close enough. Yeah, that, that they'd be like crossing in the middle. <laughs> right. Yeah. My guess is Joe Mandy. We're in New York. We're in the offices of OWA, which is uh, Olivia Wingate Artists. This is my uh, my studio away from home. It's the first yeah. time I've ever recorded in here. Really? You're, yeah. I'm you're, honored. Uh, it's a virgin episode recorded mm-hmm. from uh, from Broadway and Bond right. Street. And because I'm a virgin, so it all. Are you so. still? Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah. I would have made that assumption, but I would have felt like I would be sliding you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Funny I get you it a lot in so. a hackneyed way. Right. Now I uh, I'm a fan of your comedy. I, I, I sing your praises. Thank you. Really, I appreciate that because you yeah. don't do that often. No, I don't I do it that. often. And oddly, for some reason, I thought we you know, and I think we talked about this on the live one briefly. I can't remember. Yeah, I thought we had tension between us. Uh, there was no real tension. I, uh, I've i been a fan for a long time, and I came up to you at a show once and was trying to tell you my life story because there's a lot of overlap. And because then, we were from Albuquerque. Yes, we're both from Albuquerque. So that was you. See, because yeah. there was something that happened. I mm-hmm. think I asked you, I wrote you an email um, to to write on you know the break room life thing. Yes. And you were like, no, I've got a writing job. Oh, was I? <laughs> well, I, and, yeah. and then I thought to myself... Is this the same guy that came up to me and was so nice to me? Like I, uh, you know, the way you handled that email, I was like, "Who the f- fuck?" You know. And then I thought, "I can't be the same guy." Really? Because when I met that guy, he was so nice to me. We come, we come from Albuquerque. Then I started asking around. Uh-huh. I'm like, do, is, "Do you know a comic from Albuquerque?" I, I thought it was Joe Mandy. And and then well, see, because I'm not actually. I mean, I'm from no, Minnesota. No, but you were nice to me. Yeah. And I guess in my mind, I thought that guy would be, would well, drop think, everything to write on. I think my we both have that. See, I write you. You write curt responses too. To I emails. do. I mean, I, it's just how I sort of. Re- if I don't reply like that, I'll forget and never reply to anyone because I have. I'm always on my phone. That's and, right. It's it's a matter of pace. Yeah. And I, I do curt responses. And right. then when I get them, I'm like, fuck him. Right. It's so easy it's exactly. to misunderstand the tone of yes. email because there isn't unless you actually invest. Yes, it kills me because so, I, I, I'm very sarcastic and that is the hardest thing to convey. Uh, in, yeah, but I think that because you're sarcastic, I would imagine that any email anyone gets from you, they're right. like listening. It, especially here. if it's sincere. Like right. I wasn't trying to be a jerk. I was uh, – I mean I was writing – I like, think at sure, the time. I'll get back to you. Like, sure, right. I'll get back to you. Right. Yeah, because yeah. it's Joe Manning. Exactly, Mandy. yeah. Have you, had, have you had any misunderstood emails that have gotten you in trouble? Uh, let me think. I, not that I can rem- remember. It's all, I can always take care of it in person. But, I mean, <laughs> all, all the time that nothing comes to mind. There's no calamity, though. Have you ever misread an email? I've had that. Where mm-hmm. you, I, like, from a woman where I thought it was loaded. Right. With uh, sexual implications, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it was probably just sort of like, you know, coffee sounds good. And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, I want to fuck you. You right. know, and she's like, I think you misunderstood. That's and hilarious. It's ridiculous. You've gotten like you're a, I, I didn't really realize until recently what a, what a you know, troublemaker you are. Oh, uh, yeah. You, I mean, you see, do you, I mean, you get off on, you know, publicly, you know, you know, busting balls it's true i uh i think you're speaking of my twitter account. yeah yeah that uh what was that about i i was sort of morally opposed to twitter for the longest time and i found i found it kind of uh sort of gross and indulgent and it is completely uh but i joined it when i found out that 
people like senators and famous athletes are on there and like interact with people because it it is this weird forum where you can pretty much say anything and there's no real consequence. So, I mean, I, I joined it not and I thought I mean, I, 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 I sort of avoided joining Twitter at first because I thought it would kind of bring out the bad sides of my personality like i would be so obsessed with how many followers i had sure. and like fuck that guy's like ten thousand followers who's yeah. he like i thought that would be my obsession and it's really not i don't care how many followers good I for have. you you've overcome <laughs> thank you like, yeah I, I hit a number of followers where i stopped caring really yeah, yeah. i mean I, obviously there's still a, a twinge of that but i sort of ignore it how because, many you got uh, i think i'm over five thousand now i mean no, that's, that's, that's not much but i but i just i literally just do it to go after people I find uh, annoying, so yeah, I go after senators and. And what's happened? What are some rappers? I just get blocked. I mean, I find out. Oh, that, really? Yeah, but I mean, that's a great feeling to have David Vitter block you. Actively on say no. Let's yeah, just Cindy lose McCain. That. Cindy McCain blocked me after one tweet, and it was like it wasn't even anything. So she just knew what I was up to immediately. I I always engage. I have to struggle to engage with people with haters. Right. Because there's some sort of surge that happens. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's a rush where, and I know no matter how smart I am or how clever I think I'm being, as soon as you engage, you're fucked. You're done, right. Because they can just turn it on you. Right. Because they've, they've sucked you in. Yeah, and I'm, I, I don't really, I don't have that side of it because I'm the hater. You right, know? Right. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going after people who probably deserve it so I can live with it. And you don't get compulsively engaged? Uh, I, well, I got into a really bizarre Twitter war with this guy named Jesse Camp, who used to be an MTV VJ, uh, who, and he's just like, just, just a lunatic. And yeah. the funny thing about our, our interaction was that I never said anything mean to him. Like he just kept digging himself. He was so upset and he was so fundamentally. Well, what happened? Well, I, I was drunk one night at a bar, and I, I wrote on Twitter. I was talking about Jesse Camp with a friend, and I just wrote, like, is Jesse Camp on Twitter? Right. And then someone wrote me back and was like, yes, and sent me his profile. And then like, and for a while, I was just retweeting things he wrote uh, without commentary just because they were insane. You oh, know? Really? Yeah, just, like, so weird. Yeah. Like, it, just him complaining about his friend Brian. He's, like, saying, I'm, 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 at, I'm outside the library. The library's co closed. Where's Brian? Yeah. So I would just retweet that because, like, what is this guy's <laughs> life, you know? And then uh, he eventually, at one point, he wrote, like, who the fuck is Joe Mandy? <laughs> you just right? Out of nowhere. nowhere. And Because I guess he saw that I was. Kept, right. Retweeting. And then I wrote, like, I was like, hi, Jesse. Like, and that's it. I just said, hi, Jesse. And then he wrote back, and he was like, you know what? I'm going to sue you if you keep retweeting me because this is all copywritten. And it's my property. And then that just, I just. So you tweeted that? I was, yeah, obviously. He did that in public forum. Yeah, he did that. He, so he, wrote, he said, I'll sue you if you keep retweeting me. And yeah. then I retweeted it and I said, see you in court. You know, stuff <laughs> like that. And it, like, it was never that mean, but I was just like, yeah. you know. And it, and it yeah. started with nothing. It started with nothing. How? And it, it went on for like two days. It was, it was hilarious because he always responded. Right. And then it, it was just, it was so funny. Well, that's well. That's sort of an interesting thing about you is that you you sense you can sense the humor, the you know, inherent humor in something that is fairly. It's just indicative of a ridiculous life. I right. mean, just to, to retweet, you know, where's Brian right. on some level? Wouldn't <laughs> you know, no, I don't think that everybody would see that and go, "This is ridiculous." Right. But it's ridiculous because it's his has been, uh -huh. and who knows what his life is like. And then it actually pushed his buttons, yeah. and, and it and it served to do exactly what you set out to do to make exactly. him realize that his life is small and ridiculous. Right. And my new thing now is I follow a lot of corporate Twitter accounts because all these corporations have that. That worked for me. Yeah. And what how, what have you gotten? What are some results? Well, I just just recently I've been sort of I've been replying. The, the the White Castle corporate Twitter account is always asking these questions with fill in the blank answers, and I always just write the most morbid, depressing stuff. You know, so like, they're like commentary for their hamburgers. Yeah, they're like, stuff. "Hey, Cravers, uh, right. what are you doing this this uh, weekend?" Yeah. And then I'm just like, "I'm just gonna stay in my room and stare at candles." <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then no, they write they wrote me back and they were like, "Oh, that sounds fun. Is it White Castle?" scented candles oh, yeah, and like i was that. like I, they might be because they smell disgusting you know? oh yeah, yeah, yeah so i just and then what happened no, they, 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 they probably blocked me i don't know well the interesting thing about corporations claiming uh, the personhood that they're uh, uh, availed you know, right. legally and just you know trying to engage among us mm -hmm. obviously for promotional purposes is that i had an issue with virgin Air, virgin america right yeah i saw that and i got because of the number of followers i have to assume it was because mm -hmm. of that 
uh, you know, I got immediate response. That's amazing. It was just basically, you know, why did they, you know, separate me and my girlfriend, mm -hmm. uh, you know, without telling us? And they corrected it, and they gave us, you know, main cabin collect, main, you know, the the good seats, not right. first class, but the second down. And I, I just think it's interesting that that does give us a certain amount of power if you have the the followers, right? If you have some uh, uh, momentum, gravitas, yeah. gravitas, yeah. But you can really get you know action done. That's awesome. I mean, that's sort of why I pursued this lifestyle in the first place is just to be able to skip lines and stuff. Like I'm not, I'm not going to wait in line for anything it's a really just, gross part of, that's why you pursued what celebrity not celebrity i mean just like well yeah i mean just just show business special, in general right. yeah because i'm special <laughs> and 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 how's that panning out yeah it's it's going all right where, where have you found that uh, it has actually worked in your favor mostly just you're... comedy shows nothing else <laughs> you get your own soda in <laughs> right. a couple places right exactly <laughs> yeah, finally really... you've earned the ability to go right. now i'm a comic and i just... mean i'm still working on it hopefully in the next few years i can what are you working on right now I uh, right now I'm just sort of doing stand up, doing the odd writing job here and there. Like, what have you written on? Uh, I just finished doing uh, writing a pilot thing for Reggie Watts. Oh, okay. With Jesse Klein, she and I were the writers. So you've been to this office before? I haven't actually. No. Well, we, now you know Reggie's manager. Yeah, <laughs> we met. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know Olivia. But we uh, we met at Reggie's like super cool hotel room every day. That was our writing. Uh, oh yeah, you're yeah. staying in one of the upscale places. He was staying at this place that, like, I thought I would be padded down to, you know, to make because I was Jesse and I were both just not cool enough to be in this hotel. It was I've never seen anything like it, and that's just it was a spaceship. We went, it was a spaceship. Oh really? Yeah, he was here in New York. Yeah, which hotel? Uh, the Standard. Right, I've stayed there. Right. Yeah. So he was working at well, comics, I, or he put himself up there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know what the situation was, but the, he. The weird thing about those hotels, you know, as spectacular as they may seem and as great as they are, they're they're kind of impractical. Totally, yeah. You, I mean, like, I was at the Standard, and they've got the design, so the bathroom, the sink and everything mm -hmm. is, like, basically in the shower. Yes. And I was in a room there where you could not, the water would go all over the place. It mm -hmm. made it dangerous to be in the bathroom. Some of it would overflow under the rug. Uh -huh. And we said, uh, look, you know, you should provide squeegees in those rooms where you have fucked up the showers. Right. And, of course, they go, oh, that's a very interesting suggestion. We'll make note of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so no. there, there, it, there's, I would rather stay in a Marriott Suites hotel mm -hmm. where I have a refrigerator uh, and a microwave, and you know, some of them have stoves or, or, or an extended stay. See, when you really start working the road, that's where the real payoff is going to be. Uh, what, stoves? Yeah, stoves yeah. in hotel rooms. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> so, I look forward to that. So when, when you get to a particular town, if you're there for three days, you're not held hostage to the dietary uh, 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 restrictions of corporate food uh, court Yeah, that's food. the worst because I cannot handle that. I have the most sensitive stomach. I can't do that. I know. Didn't I bring you somewhere and you – had a problem? Uh, oh, wait. I mean, probably. Where yeah. did we? Where was that? In Vancouver? Did uh, we go? Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, I had fried scallops. Like I should have known better. Oh no, Seattle. Yeah, yeah I was in Seattle. Yeah. Really? Oh, immediately. Like we, I finished my meal and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go. Yeah, I gotta go. Oh, that's right. You room. couldn't even make it out for the bike. <laughs> <laughs> nope. nope, I was done for the most of the afternoon. Is that is that clinical? I mean, can you treat it's, it? Or what? I mean, I've. It, in high school, they thought I had the most like severe case of IBS they'd ever seen. They thought it was uh, stomach cancer because I just I, I literally for about four years woke up every morning with just explosive diarrhea. Just yeah. every morning, just that was just my part of my routine. Yeah, have you got any good shitting in public stories in your pants? Uh, there was one time, <laughs> actually, there was one time I was on a conclave. Sorry, being like, insensitive. No, it's fine. I that's it's my life, you know. <laughs> Shitting all the time. Uh I was at this thing for my Jewish youth group when I was like 15. Jewish yes. youth group stories. Yeah, and we were on a bus uh, in Wisconsin and we had just uh we had just gone to Taco Bell, so I mean already red flag. Did you know when you were eating it that Pro I mean, yeah, it's always like sort of Russian roulette with Mexican yeah. food. Yeah. Mex <laughs> Mexican roulette. Yeah. And uh Immediately, I just knew I was, I, I, I had to go, and it was like in a school bus. Yeah. So there was no bathroom, and I had to go up to my rabbi, <laughs> the front of the bus, and say, you know, uh, bad things are happening to me. We really need to pull over at the next rest stop. And uh, he was like, yeah, I'll make sure of it. So we went back. I went back to the back of the bus, and, you know, the rest stop was five miles ahead. And I'm just like, you know, Come pacing. On, and, yes. and then the bus driver just blew right past it. And the next rest stop wasn't for like 45 miles. And I didn't know. I, had, I, I My body was going to explode, you know. Yeah. And I, and I, to this day, I can't listen to Tom Petty without thinking, 
of uh I, I put on the Wildflowers mm-hmm. album and yeah. I, like the only time I've ever successfully meditated. But I meditated for those forty five minutes to the next rest stop and ran and I my friend was in the bathroom and he said he's never heard a human body make those are kinds of noises. I was in there for everyone on the bus is waiting for me. I, mean, I was in there for like thirty five minutes, just so that that is a, an amazing testament to the power of meditation and complete mm. fear of peer judgment. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I probably there. I probably hurt my body in the long run the way I was clenching because every muscle. That that is a that is a superhuman feat. Mm-hmm. That that is almost. Niche-y. I still to this day I don't know how I did it because it was. It was bad. What the? I, I guess the power of being the guy. Yeah. That shit in the back of the school bus for the rest of your right, life forever. Yeah. And and was this the beginning of the trip? Uh, that we were on our way back to. So you would made it. You know, you were cool the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like you know, people still thought the same of you. You were Joe Mandy. Well, they knew I was in there for. Their, they knew something was up. That but, I was. But but like if you had to, like, it's amazing to me that that those kind of things can define. I mean, literally, it would have defined the future. Oh, of your totally. Life. Yeah, and actually, my high school. I went to a really just insane high school, and you could not take a shit in my high school because uh, if you if anyone saw like you know the the bathrooms were sort of wide open if you walked in and if anyone saw legs dangling or you know if they saw legs under the stall yeah then you were just you were gonna get tortured people would throw like wet p- toilet paper at you and just for shitting just for shitting so i <laughs> what kind of high school is that i, I went yeah i, I kind of remember that though that you know there, there i remember situations where i don't know if it was high school but there was one situation where they they didn't even have doors on the stalls right it, it wasn't that bad but i mean you could they would you would usually what would happen and i only I actually, ninth grade, I took a couple shits in high school and then vowed never again, you know, because people would kick the door open, laugh at you, throw stuff at you. It was terrifying. Oh, throw, so you're saying they would throw shit at you in the bathroom? Yeah, not oh. like shit, not No, no, physical, no, no, but, no yeah. but, but it wouldn't happen in, the, like in the classroom or something. No, but what would happen, too, is if they, you, you came out, yeah. uh, there would always be some dude who would see you walk out and then just walk behind you down the hallway and be like, yo, that dude took a shit. That dude took a shit. So you'd just be like this awful, awful, shameful feeling of... Don't you ever wonder what drives those people? Uh, I mean, what, I mean... It is kind of funny. I mean, like, you have to realize I was, like, four feet tall and braces and sweater Oh, really? Vest. I mean, like, I was... You, so you had it coming an easy kid. Yeah, in high school. Yeah, it was easy. Oh, my um, God. How much hate built up from that era of your life? Man, oh, my, that, yeah, my high school years were... Like, yeah. You were so, short, had braces. I was short. You're Not Jewish, only that, I went. Wore I mean, glasses. My high, I went to St. Paul Central High School, which where in St. Paul, Minnesota, yeah. St. Paul Central, which had a uh, it has a reputation for being sort of a a rough. I mean, it's it, it's like the movie, the movie Dangerous Minds. Yeah, it was like that school, but with like an honors program. Right. So like it actually had this like kind of apartheid vibe to the school, where like the white kids took the honor, the white kid and the white kids and the Asian girls took honors classes, and everyone else took regular classes and hated and, those honors and it was just there was just some tension like and the the, the the honors classes tended to be on the top two floors because mm-hmm. cream rises to the top or whatever <laughs> and uh yeah and there was just there was a little it was just it was just strange yeah. the whole vibe was very strange and there were there used to be race riots before i got there so i mean that was like we had a daycare oh right yeah for okay. this, and actually our football field had barbed wire surrounding it but the barbed wire went in so, like why would it go why would it why would you want to keep people in the football field, oh, so not they were out like, of it? You know what I mean? They were probably preparing just in case some other uh, riot situation right. happened. They would just, ro- you know. Right. I mean, like, the, the, the rumor, I don't know if this is true, but the rumor was that the architect who designed our school also uh, designed the prison in Stillwater, Minnesota. They say also designed Auschwitz. <laughs> right. It was, no, it was sort of like a modern-looking building, so, but, like, the doors would magnetically lock during class and stuff. It was very just, like... Prison like. Oh, know? so this is one of those situations where they did a, an architectural experiment with one of the more difficult schools yeah. and said that, you know, give it these elements of securing yeah. and, it. And um, my dad, when I was in ninth grade, my dad's job was he put kids in prison. Like he was a juvenile prosecutor, right? So, uh, like, my third day of school, I got lost in a hallway and this giant dude just grabbed me by my neck and threw me against the locker and was like, Your dad put my cousin in prison. 
And oh I was my just God. Like, so you were in prison. Uh, yeah. And I, <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know. I was just like, I, yeah, and he's a dick. You know what it was? He sold your dad out right. like that. He was like, he makes me mow the lawn. <laughs> yeah, that fucker. We have a huge lawn. Oh, that's great. It just immediately threw dad under yeah. the bus. Like, what, 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 yeah. You got to. Yeah, you have to. And I mean, yeah. I, and that was like part of my, the point of my life where I didn't. Both of my parents were trial lawyers, so I just there there was a few years where I just didn't talk to my parents because they would just, oh man, between my sister and I, we would just get cross examined on everything. Oh my you god, know, that was just how we were raised, just uh, constant. So always looking for the lie. They were always looking for the lie, even that it was just it was crazy. So it, it, and my parents have, are much. They never better. said that my client, my son. <laughs> there was Basically, no- I mean, like we would be sitting at a dinner table, and if they smelled anything fishy. They would. They were back on the clock and just grilling us until they figured out what the issue was or whatever. And so, oh my god! And, and my sister and I both handled that in different ways because I think from seventh to tenth grade, I just basically just pleaded the fifth on everything. You know, what I mean, I just didn't talk to them because I didn't want to incriminate myself. <laughs> so I really like. There was a few years where I hardly ever talked to my parents. Just out of fear of being uh, grilled. Yeah, and my sister, on the other hand, she. Uh, she sort of just pled insanity. My sister was just this like wall of noise. She just like everything was just anytime my parents tried to confront her on it, she'd just scream and slam her door. And that was, I kind of jealous. Actually, that's a much better tactic. I just internalized everything. And, uh, yeah. Well, that's interesting that like that it's a, it's a unique, um, take on the, you know, boundaryless intrusiveness of parents mm-hmm. that, that, you know, you're not, you're not in a situation where there's, there's clearly you know, emotional, interdependence or that type of boundarylessness, but they're literally like, they will take all of their skill and craft oh. from years of, of prosecutorial. Really good at it too. You know? Oh, they both yeah. were really good. Yeah. And, and that's relentless. It was, it was, that's the exact word relentless. It was, it was just insane. And it's funny now that like my parents have totally, I think my whole family sort of chilled out, you know, right. and we're all older and my dad actually is sort of retired from law and is now starting his own dog training business the dream right? yeah the dream <laughs> and so uh he's got to control something exactly yeah uh and my dad actually we had this funny moment last year where he had just taken all these really kind of intensive courses on how to it's kind of animal behavioral stuff you uh-huh. know and he was learning a lot about uh dog he didn't training. ask you to get in a box no 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 <laughs> but he did sort of come up to me and and apologize for how he uh treated me as a kid how everything he does with dogs now is all about positive reinforcement, and he was sort of apologizing that he didn't for treat being you more like a dog. Yeah, exactly. I was like that. I was like, it was kind of this touching thing where my dad sort of, you know, the meaning. Like, he's very this very touching thing. He's yeah. trying to, you know, yeah. tell me this. He's very sorry, but I was like, okay, that's great. But now you now I know you think of me as a dog. Yeah, right. yeah. And then after he said that, he said, "Come here, boy." And he, <laughs> right. He yeah. Rubbed your head. Gave me a liver treat. It was delicious. <laughs> but how did you like? As a comic, you know, and as somebody that, you know, I, I had some liabilities. I mean, I had braces. You know, I don't, you know, you, you seem to be a little more disciplined than I am. I, I don't, what what were you like in, in high school in terms of education? Were you a nerd? I was, uh, I was, an, I was, I've always been sort of uh, an like a intellectual idiot. You know what I mean? That was always sort of, I was I smart and I, I got good grades, but mm-hmm. I was always doing stupid things to get attention. Uh, in fact, I ended up running for student council. We had like a student council president, yeah. sort of like a student council olig- oligarchy. That was yeah. sort of how our school, and so there were 10 people who were in charge of the student council, and I ran and won, and my campaign was just utter ridiculousness. Just the, all my posters were pictures of me and Kathy Lee Gifford, and nothing made any sense, and it was clearly I was the anti-candidate, right. and I won, and I literally only did that so I could get a card to leave school and go use the bathroom at my house. Like it was a complete <laughs> cynical use of political power, but I needed that card to get because otherwise, I mean, I spent sophomore and junior year just skipping school if I was having problems, you know? So I was like, I saw an opportunity. And so your whole life has really been defined by your, your sphincter. Oh, completely. Your... Yeah. I mean, uh, up until, yeah, I, I, I sort of manage it now. I, I take fiber pills every day and that sort of, it works. Uh, it's magic. Yeah. So, so you got the card so you could just at any time say, I got to go home. Yes. And spend some official time school, school. So business. that whole like shitting at school thing, the fact that it was so such a, a social liability yeah. was just torture. for It you. was crazy. Yeah. I, I was late. I mean, it, most of my problems happen early in the morning because it's stress-induced, my, my stomach problems. 
So it's still to this day, like if I have to wake up too early for like going to the airport, I have to make sure you give yourself I time and like, yeah, an extra 40. Now what about performing? I mean, when you have larger performing opportunities, are you one of those people that's no, sort of like... uh, well, when I first started, I had problems for mm -hmm. sure. But yeah, I don't, I've never had like real stage fright. So that was never really going up on stage. Wasn't, but what about the, haven't you had the fear of things not working? Uh, I, initially at first really yeah. you just you sort of just were able to take the stage and not yeah have that sort of uh you you oh, that's interesting mm -hmm. i mean even you know, when i was back even back in junior high i would uh you know do i ran for another i ran for student council and there was a big speech and i had no problem with that and did you kill i killed yeah i killed i uh I literally was just like, I want, because you got, you got to go to these city wide student council meetings mm -hmm. and get, eat free pizza. And go to the bathroom there. I was there. just like, I want to eat free pizza. And people were like, yes, okay. Go to the bathroom in other yeah, places. Yeah, exactly. Other cities. Yeah. <laughs> other parts of town. Right. All over St. Paul. Did, did you like, when you were out with your friends, did you know where the good bathrooms were? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> for sure. I, and I have a mental map of Manhattan. I know every bathroom. Stores? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's hard here. It is. It, yeah, I mean the 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 go to place used to be um, the the Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. but sometimes you never know when you're going to walk into a yeah, a, a homeless, uh, a homeless situation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> had a few of those, <laughs> and then feeling like, and like feeling you're in, interrupting. You know, like, yeah. I wouldn't want anyone to do that when I'm. So there's bathing. an understanding, I imagine, between people with uh, irritable bowel syndrome and, and homeless bathing rituals. Yeah, in yeah. Manhattan. You, there's a lot of you, yeah. You meet a lot of interesting people. Oh. Way. So you're, I guess, what I'm getting at is, in high school, as a comic, usually you find some way to ingratiate yourself to those that would torture you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think junior year, I ended up winning like class clown. I was in the my high school had an improv troupe. And I, my whole like actually my whole comedy career came out of some dude uh sort of dismissing me when I said I wanted to run uh, you know try out for the the improv team at my high school he was like wow you're not funny and to this day I mean like that's the reason I I was just like fuck you so, yeah I guess that's why I, I related to you and, and maybe we're kindred spirits is that a lot of your life was fueled by spite oh yeah yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> spite against those mm -hmm. who would condescend and judge right. But were you able to sort of baffle and uh, ingratiate yourself to the more menacing of the jocks and perhaps the, the yeah? More I mean, my favorite the, story, the bad yeah. element. My favorite story uh, of of that. Uh, my in ninth grade, I took Spanish in high school. It was the only non honors class I ever took, uh, and it, uh, it. I showed up the first day, ninth grade, so I was very short and braces and. Sweater vest. I don't know why I wore a sweater vest. And what I made you do that. What I thought it was cool. <laughs> uh, and I got into Spanish the first day of class, and it was just me and it was like me and like the JV basketball team. That was the class basically. Right. And uh, I I was like it'll be fine. I listened to Outcast or whatever, and uh, I sit down and the, and they they were just ruthless. They would make fun of me. They would uh, call me names. They would choke me i got choked a lot but it was never violent they right. just would come up from behind when i wasn't expecting it and like rap sometimes it was like piano wire i don't like they had piano wire they would like wrap wire around my neck and i would freak out obviously yeah and then they would let go and just crack up Ugh. they'd be like ah ha, ha, you stupid yeah yeah you know yeah, and he's we, like oh, oh. At, he's frightened for the right reason right what an idiot right what an idiot <laughs> i was like how stupid of me to freak out yeah um so it was just it was bad, and they would throw like empty cans of soda at my head and stuff. And it was just it sucked. And, and the then, teacher just let this happen. Yeah, our te yeah our teacher that Spanish teacher was so broken, you know, she was so done with life that she like it was it was chaos. Like when she was an older public yep. school teacher. Yep, she looked like Newman from Seinfeld. So ever, everyone called her Newman. Like oh that was, she'd be God. they would call her Miss Newman, and she would respond to. That. I mean, it was bad. And uh, and then that December, our t our principal made this big announcement that there no more gambling was allowed in the hallways. I didn't was there gambling? Yeah, people like played dice in the hallways and stuff. Oh and, my god. And uh what I kind of fucking high school was <laughs> it was crazy. Um and we there I, were active dice games. There were active then? dice games there were there were like the Asian like, come on, seven. the Asian kids would have break dance competitions in between classes. Like, in the hallway. Would, in the hallway. And I actually started doing this thing. It's like it's I do it on stage sometimes too. I got really good at making it look like I was about to start breakdancing. 
Because actually, I was just trying to get through the hallway, right? But I would get in the middle of this like big circle, and it would be like my turn, yeah. and I would start like moving around to the to the music, and yeah. like you know, yeah. pumping my shirt and making it look like I was about. To, and I would just do it until they realized I was never gonna start breaking. And I would go for like two minutes without actually doing any <laughs> dancing before they like pushed me out of the oh <laughs> circle. God. But anyway, but back to the, the the story. So our our principal, she instituted this no gambling policy, uh, and I I saw an opportunity, and I went up to these kids in the back of my class and I was like, you know, I can teach you a gambling game that you'll never get in trouble for playing if you just stop choking me. Right? And it was they, that clear? There was a was negotiation. Like, yeah, yeah, it was a clear negotiation. Yeah. And they thought about it and the next day I brought I taught them how to play dreidel for money. Stop it. I swear. Yeah. And so for like a good month outside my Spanish class, you would walk by and just see these black kids in like Averex jackets huddled over a top. Yeah, just like, yo, that's a W, motherfucker. Pay up. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Were, were they gambling for chocolate coins? No, they weren't. <laughs> for real, for real coins, for I, real paper money. I wonder what Yahweh thought of that. Yeah. I, I, who I think that, well, no, but I thought that, that you, know, it, you know, when you think about the history of the Jewish people and the Jewish scholars and the debate and Talmudic arguments that, uh, that, that, elevated and, and guaranteed the safety yes, of a Jew. Right. You did something very, <laughs> I did. very proactive. Yeah, who knows? Maybe they converted. <laughs> That's a W. I don't even know what's on a dreidel. So did you do the Hanukkah thing? I, I uh, No, not really. I've sort of, um, now that I'm away from my parents' judgment, I don't really, I'm not too uh, practicing. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know, you know if it's the same with you, but like, as a Jew growing up in New Mexico, and you were there for a brief time. For 11 years. But having parents that come from Jews, but we were never really identified ourselves as anything but conservative. Right. There was still that sort of like, we're better than the reform because they have an organ, singing. Oh, we were, that that was us. Oh, you had yeah. the organ? Yeah, uh, probably. And, uh, but I, you know, the weird thing coming out of it, outside of identi identifying myself culturally mm -hmm. and, and following a certain number of the traditions for, because of, of family and it was expected Ritual, of you, yeah. I was never given any sense of God at all. Yeah, I'm ne I never bought into it. And well, I never... It's not even buying into it. No one ever said I had to pray. Uh -huh. No one ever really, you know, you know, made me understand, you know, what belief meant. Mm -hmm. You know, it was never, I was never, uh, and, and I'm grateful for it. It was never posited in my brain that, you know, God was something to be feared or that God answered any questions whatsoever. Right. I mean, someone's got to drive that in. Yeah. I never got that either. I, and I never, I never, either. I went and I went, I was like, I was Jewish growing up, you know, like I went to Jewish summer camp and like Me too. youth group stuff and yep. never, never took that part of it seriously. I mean, you know, if you if you drop a, my friends and I were just awful. Like we, when, you know, when you drop a prayer book, you're supposed to kiss it. Right. We would drop it on purpose just to like make out with our, you know, like act, you know, just getting, yeah, yeah, going yeah. to second base with our prayer books. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, we we're just terrible it's and weird, never right? took it seriously. And, and then I had, I had this uh, experience a couple past, so it was, Four or five years ago, it was Passover, and uh, I was I was doing the Passover thing to see if it meant anything to me, and I ended up getting conned by this Israeli guy for like four hundred dollars when I had I had no money, and it would the whole time he was like it's a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah, and I knew I was getting conned, but in my head I was like. Maybe. Maybe. Because the whole thing was like, he was saying, it was crazy. This guy was wait, awful. I don't understand. This guy was at a Seder? Or he was running no, an expensive No, man. Seder? It was a straight up, like, the like, I was waiting for a train. I was at work. And it was over Passover. It was, uh, it was over Passover. It was okay. Like day so you're aware of three. Passover. I'm, I'm, yeah, and I'm, I'm pissed off that I can't eat bread. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so you do, okay, so you're, you're saying that, like, you know, you did, you followed the rules for Passover. I was following the rules, yes. And I was seeing if it meant anything. Right. Because up until that point, like, I was just doing it because I was expected to. Was, well, you go, you eat, and you right. do the play and there's something funny and kind of, right. you know, endearing about if you're with family. Yeah, but I wasn't. I was right. by myself in New York, and I was seeing, you know, if, yeah. if I were in. search for meaning. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then I definitely found it. Uh, yeah. This guy came up to me, uh, and he was like, excuse me, are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? And I, oh, I, I feel bad, but I usually say no. You know, oh, really? Because I just don't. Like... I usually fight them to not make me do tefillin on the train. Oh, right. But I, I know that's what they're going to do. And right. it's like, so I also. So seat yeah. No, well, he wasn't. Normally it is. This guy looked like Michael Chiklis, okay. right? Like yeah, a tan yeah. Michael Chiklis. Okay. And uh, I was like, yeah. And he started telling me how 
he, at first he was just wanting to know if this was the train to Queens because he right. had to get to LaGuardia. Right. And then he started telling me this weird story about his girl, his his wife and his child were at this house in Astoria, and he was trying to uh, get his uh, uh, shekels in order and all, it just made no sense and, uh, and he was like can you help me it's a mitzvah I just need you to go to this bank and help me convert shekels into dollars because I don't have a bank account in America and I was like wow okay sure whatever this is man. a hustle designed for Jews it was a hu- yeah it was and it's also the worst hustle like it, when it got to the point where he we, we, we surfaced we were, we were on 59th street and he started talking to me about like he started asking me about my girlfriend and is she Jewish and I said no and then he was like Better dumper, you know what I mean? He's like, who are you? Yeah. You know, and then but, he started, but yet you're following him to a bank. Exactly, and then he's like, you know, our, you know, my grandparents didn't die in the Holocaust for you to date a Christian girl, and I was like, you know, and then the whole time I'm like, they didn't. You're clearly a liar. You know, yeah, you're yeah, a, yeah. you're a liar. But I'm trying to, but he keeps he just nailing home that it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. He's, yeah, I'm I'm helping him. We're Jewish. We're Achim. You know, all this whole thing. So we get to the bank, and uh, I'm like, okay, so give me your shekels. And then he was like, no, you, you misunderstand. I. Uh, I need I need money to turn into shekels, and I was like, "What are you? That's the opposite of what you said." And he told me you know, he needed four hundred dollars. He did the conversion rate. He said this many shekels, and then was like, "Uh, it's about four hundred. And but at the time, also, I had a broken iPod, and I was I was actually waiting to buy a new iPod. Wait, so you could check the shekel to. Curve, so I I don't know why I did this. I went and I got four hundred dollars out of my savings account. And I handed it. I was about to hand it to the guy, and then I was like, "Wait, I need your information." You know, if you're because he said his name. First of all, he said his name was Israel from Israel, right? And then he owned the biggest falafel stand in Jerusalem. Like he was the worst con man in the world. But you're falling for it. I was completely then knowingly, but, 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 and I don't. It's the I don't know why. To this day, I don't know why I did this. And so I gave him the money, and then he wrote on the like a deposit slip. You know, it, it was all in Hebrew uh-huh. script, like Israel from Israel, a phone number with like thirty digits, right? And then he just walked away with all my money. And then I was just like, I just gave that dude my iPod. That's yeah. my iPod. Yeah. And I was just like, just just to see if like I can trust this. I mean, right. I don't know why I did it. It, it. it bothers me so much. And I, I was like, well, at least I got a story out of it. And I did it. I told it, that story a few nights later on stage. And in the back of the room, I hear someone just freak out. And when I get off stage, it was Nick Kroll. This du- same dude conned Nick Kroll out of like... Two hundred and fifty dollars, uh, you know, like on two bishvat or something. Like, it, like this guy knows how to find like, uh, like insecure twenty-three year old Jews going through some sort of spiritual crisis. Spiritual crisis, yeah, yeah. So, it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. We're achim, yeah. That's another interesting story. Yeah, that you know, you 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 taught the Goliaths how to play dreidel for money. <sighs> yes. And then you know, this is some other weird. I mean, that that story is like a, like a, a parable. It was, and also it was. I, I also had this like very. But how did you come to peace with it? I mean, well, obviously... what I did was when I handed him the money, I said, "I just want you to know, if you don't pay me back, I don't believe in God. So you're gonna have to deal with that." Like, like some Cameron Crowe movie, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just forcing That's this. That was the best you could do. Yeah. Like the 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 thing. The... And then he was like, "Okay, you know," and then just skipped what away. Care? Yeah. He what is... does he care? Exactly. And like, like it was like this. I was forcing. I was trying to. For, I was forcing this. This huge plot point in my life, I you know, you, you will pay me back, or I don't believe in God. Like he cares if I believe in God, and then you know. So the real punchline of that story, on, as a stage piece, was that someone else had run into the same guy. Well, now it is. I mean, at first I was just telling the story because I was trying to figure out if it was anything worthy of. Stand-up, but like, because you know? like in, in, in but now, but yeah, but like Nick Crow, they, they, it's so funny that and. But because in my life, even today, there's something about. Our vulnerability. Like I come from – like you come from a family of litigators, which is interesting. Mm. So, you know, they call bullshit. Yes. And, you know, I come from, you know, a father who is very susceptible to being a mark, mm. that he's a sucker. So most of my adult life, I know that I was brought up like that, that, that like, you know, that I'm easily suckered. So I've had to be vigilant really? against having that sensitivity. Mm. You know, and, and I'm not sure what it is. And I think part of it for me is that there's something impressive – about hustlers that, that, you know, you're sitting yeah. there. It's like this, they're, they're, you're being played and you know, you're being played. He, they commit a hundred percent, but you want to believe yeah. even though in your mind, like my father, this has, guy, the whole time I was like, you, you're, you are a liar. You're terrible at this, but I, but, for yeah, some, but I was strung along. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know why it was like, hip, hip, you're hypnosis. a smart guy. You can't figure out why. No. Other than I needed a reason to not believe in God, and it was like a selfish like if if that's if it's four hundred dollars for me to 
live with that, then whatever. Like I, I'm trying. Like there, there's some because I had something like that happen to me, and it, and it sort of stuck in my craw. You know, like I I bought you know like years ago I bought pot on the street in San Francisco, mm-hmm. uh, or no, it was here in New York, from uh, from a junkie. But okay. I wanted to buy pot, mm-hmm. but I I didn't do it. The, and I knew I was going to get burned. I knew there was no way I wasn't going to get burned. Right? How does that guy have weed? Right. So I I came home and I had a, a big you know balloon full of garbage. Right. And and I knew when I did it, and and I think that on some on some level with that, maybe this is it. You never wanted to do that again, so you were going to pay four hundred dollars. Yeah. To it never sort have of that felt happen. like that because also I'm never going to find anyone that obviously. But there's but there's something about you know like there's something about because you know I have to assume on some level you still fucking hate yourself for doing that. Oh, so much. So that that feeling is enough to stop you. <laughs> yeah, you paid four hundred dollars to be wary of anyone's bullshit and not fall for it. it. Very well could be. Yeah, that's fucking interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that I mean, and I guess that would be the the, the parable is that it, it cost you that much money to never do that again. Right, I'm fine with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. Because like I, you know, the situation that I I can relate to that is that you know, my father has has become this weird sort of like you know uh, dog trainer. No, no not okay. a dog trainer. He, we went through that. My father, uh, we bred. Oh, you know he you know he was, was a dog shower. Okay. We had old English sheepdogs, and we had one that was a champion. And my father was very uh, into showing dogs. Sure. And we went through that as a family. Okay. You know, like, you know, five or four English sheepdogs at one time, and the, and the very special one that we had to drive and hang out with dog show people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he was prone to those sort of weird, obsessive hobbies. That one included live dogs. Mm-hmm. But uh, now he's like into alternative medicine and he's very hung. He's very into this vitamin thing. And I went to one of these new agey type of expos Mm -hmm. with him because his buddy who manufactures a vitamin called the memory revitalizer uh, is someone he has aligned himself with. And, you know, this guy is like a weird kind of libertarian. You know, the FDA is on our ass and, and he makes this vitamin that's got all this shit in it that's supposed to, you know, fight Alzheimer's. And my father Obviously, he's very impressed with this character. And when I met him, I looked right through him. I said, this guy is fucking snake oil. This is the definition <laughs> yeah. of snake oil salesman. This is what it really is. And, and, I, and, I, and I held that. You know, and I held that frame of mind. And then you know, I don't know when it happened, but I am now buying vitamins directly from him. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that was your memory. I don't know if it's changed anything, but, yeah. the, but with that kind of hustle – you know, you, you get involved with it, and then, like, you know, whether it's not it's just the, you know, the regular ebb and flow of your neurotransmitters on a day-to-day basis, if you have a good day, because you're going to attribute it to of course. the vitamins. So then you get into this weird thing where you're afraid to stop, mm-hmm. and that's how they get you. It's also smart to have a villain like the federal government. Well, yeah, you, you know, like, because my dad's like, yeah, they're always checking his shit. Are they checking his shit? I mean, he did just change the capsules from green to blue, which is a more attractive uh, you know, looking capsule, yeah. but you got to take six of them. And, you know, that's it. You know, if you get hooked that's on hard them, to remember to take six memory pills. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do it every day, right. you, you would hope that. So sort of like Islam. <laughs> Is yeah. it? I mean, you have to take six pills different times every day. <laughs> no, you do it all at once. Oh, you do it all at once. That's yeah. nothing like Islam. But like, you know, to this day, I'm like, why am I doing this knowing that it's bullshit? Because there's part of me that thinks maybe it's not bullshit. Now, what happened when you tried to track that guy down? Uh, I mean, I called that number, and of course, it was just like nothing, mm-hmm. and uh, sort of just gave up. I just I knew it was a lost cause. So now, well, let's talk about the website and the book. Sure. Uh, what is it? Look at this fucking hipster. Yeah. How did that start? Uh, it started actually with my my parents came to town uh, last year uh, for my dad's birthday, and I took them out to dinner in my neighborhood in Williamsburg. And when they got off the train at North 7th Street, my dad's head exploded because he had never he had no idea what he was looking at. You know, and my dad used to be a hippie. So he so he sort of has uh, rationalized that like, well, I was fighting, you know, it was, it was a war going on. I was fighting the war. So like he kept that like, who are these people? Who are what are these they hipsters? Stand for? Yeah. He was like, are they against the war? And I was yeah. like, no, I don't <laughs> think so. You know, and yeah, the more questions he asked about hipsters, the more confused he got and the harder it was to explain uh-huh. what what. What, what I was surrounded by, you right. know, and uh, so I told my dad when we were eating dinner that he should start a blog called Is This a Hipster, 
where he would take pictures of people in my neighborhood and then just underneath like yes or no and then people could vote whether they were or not and then I realized you know shortly after dinner that my dad's never gonna be able to figure out right. like a blog his software so uh, or his new camera or well he he's actually very good with a dev with the camera but uh, also he lives in suburban Philadelphia so there's no hipsters really you know and mm -hmm. uh, uh, so then I, I started it like a week later I started a website called look at this fucking hipster and just was taking pic pictures of people in my neighborhood and uh, it, it's one of those weird internet things that just I had no intention it was just a thing for my friends and I and my dad just a joke and it just blew up kind of completely out of my hands and I, I did no publicity for it or anything like this the the layout of the blog is just like the default settings you know what i mean i put no right real effort into it it was just a yes or no question no it's just it was just pictures of people uh around williamsburg and then just funny captions underneath like little quotations of uh, what they would be saying or what i imagine them thinking you know right and uh it sort of it was just like one of those there was all this so i guess all this animosity towards hipsters and it just blew up and uh, I felt very uneasy about it because even though I thought it was funny, like I had the problem like people liking it almost yeah. too much. Right. Where, uh, you know, you thought you're doing a disservice to your peers. Well, I just I, I had I had no intention of it be people becoming like there's a guy on my website who, who became like people now call him beans. Because I I made I, I put a few pictures of him and I called him Beans because he looks like he should be called Beans. Yeah. So and he goes to a lot of concerts and people like get their picture taken with Beans and stuff. It's so bizarre. Has he accepted it? Yeah, I mean he in my book he's got his own chapter. I had a professional <laughs> photographer. He came into Brooklyn and uh, we did like a full photo shoot with him. He's so a, you, you it was you did what every hipster wants is you gave him a certain credibility and notoriety. Yeah, and for us, he wasn't even, he's not even really a hipster. He's just like this lunatic, but... Uh, so he's just, he was waiting for a nickname. Oh, man. Yeah, he's the funniest guy. Uh, and so, yeah, and then, so the blog was, it got really big, really quick, and I started getting, like, emails to my anonymous Gmail account from publishers saying, you know, let's make this a book, and I was just like, I didn't, I had real no, no interest, really, in doing that. And then I got an email from a friend saying that there was some guy in New York that was going around town pitching my book, saying he was the author of the blog. So going into meetings and trying to get a book deal. Uh, so I mean, the, the, book, the book I ended up writing was completely out of like a defensive stance where I was just like – Did you find out who he was? I don't know who the guy was. You really don't? I don't. I really don't. It wasn't Beans. It wasn't, it wasn't Beans. <laughs> uh so again, spite drove you to create. Yeah, and and defensiveness, yeah. And uh the book itself, it was it's funny. Like I I ended up writing the whole thing in just a few weeks. It's, and has it sold well? I think so. I mean, I don't I It's hard to know with that. It's hard to know. I mean, it's at Urban Outfitters and stuff, but I've always tried to separate that from my stand up cuz the What I, are you going to do? Bring slides on? Right. And also yeah. it's just that's not my It's fun. I mean, it's not really my my thing that's not my sense of humor really it's just oh it's just a, like it was a it was a thing. side project right. i was working the on pictures are good people like pictures right it was an easy thing uh it wasn't even a side project it was this thing you just did as a fluke right completely now let me like ask you in a general sense about hipsters because i've been working on a joke that you know that there's a confusion in terms of of where some hipsters draw from historically, like you know, I've had, I've I have a big problem with handlebar mustaches. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a, you should, yeah, everyone should. I have a problem with fedoras, mm -hmm. and and then I saw a guy with a handlebar mustache and a fedora, and I think he was like wearing jodhpurs or something. Right. And then like it, it occurred to me that it looks like he dressed quickly running through a time tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you think that'll work as a joke? Yeah, that's funny. And and, and I don't like. When you know, obviously, there's a resentment, you know, and I have found in my life that a lot of that type of resentment, it's it's primarily based on the amount of effort put into their personal appearance, right? That that defines any sort of uh, you know cultural meme at any given time, yeah. And and the hipsters seem to try to outdo each other with with resources uh, in, in terms of uh, vintage facial hair, you know, found. Right. And they're all just trying to out silly each other. Is it silliness though? Because I I think some of these people are presenting themselves rather seriously. Well, they are very serious about being silly i mean i don't i don't really know i can't really speak for them but right. the funniest thing about hipsters to me is that no one is a hipster right no one will it's a it's a slur right so the biggest hipster in the world has come up to me people who are textbook 
hipsters saying, oh, I hate hipsters. I love your book. And it's like, okay, dude. Well, did you ever do any, uh, you know, research is it into the, is it etymology? Uh, of the, I mean, I think that the word hipster really sort of came out of, you know, white guys hanging around black jazz clubs. It was. I mean, I, I've done, I did some research, obviously, for uh-huh. my very important Now I don't know if I, etymology I was the right word. That is the right word. Oh, oh you, good. You nailed it. Oh, uh, but it, yeah, it started off as sort of like a jazz term. Right. For, yeah posers really but people who were into the hip subculture and, and that uh, kind of evolved into beatnik yeah so and, so that that the history of the hipster is uh you know the um cold war outsider really you know you got hipster the jazz age white guy and that evolved into the cold war outsider and now i think it's just evolved into you know people who are trying with everything they have to look different than other right. people sort of aimless and, and assume a posture yeah that that i think the 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 real fallacy of it is that it means nothing other than what they're trying to do on an appearance level right and my biggest problem with it is that whenever you see any documentary or anything about the 60s they show the same stock footage of like Haight Ashbury and Jefferson Airplanes playing, and it's like these people with like flowers in their hair dancing in in the park. Yeah. And I'm just afraid, 30 or 40 years from now, it's all gonna be stock footage of like North North Seven, Bedford and North Seven, yeah. and Animal Collective's gonna be playing. There's yeah, all these yeah. guys with like overalls and handlebar mustaches, and well, I you would playing you, kickball. You, you would know? hope that they they even have that power of definition. I mean, I think that you know the reason that that 60s footage is, is used. Is you know you know certainly now is is um, it's almost mocking that you know that like your father I mean they believed that that taking the liberties to present themselves like that was it was an actual rebellious act right. and, and identified themselves as as a community with a cause and they they had one for mm-hmm. real you know what's sad about that culture now is that any time there's you know legitimate social outcry outside of them you know being forced to only be active in 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 penned off areas that they designate for activism is that the cameras on CNN will always go to like nine people that look like wavy gravy and some squatters right so it undermines everything so that actual image of the hippie has has you know now you know is clownish it is right and and it's sad because you know they actually did something I right. believe. I mean, I, I hipsters comparatively, yeah. And I mean, and that's the that's the thing is that's what confused your father. Do they do they stand for anything? Yeah, they're just clowns. I mean, <laughs> it, when you look at when you look at what a clown yeah. is, they're clowns. Yes, absolutely. They're serious clowns, which is the worst kind of clown. Well, yeah, well, I guess, yeah, I actually have another question. That yeah, the one thing that impresses me about your comedy is that it's literate, it's smart, it's long form. Uh, you know, you seem to you know come from a tradition. Uh, of w- what I will identify as Jewish monologists, you know, uh, along the lines of of uh, uh, of Woody Allen and, and some, uh, but a little more personal. Right. Uh, okay. And and you know that that type that uh, that type of of comedian is 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 rare now. Uh, you know, in the seventies, you know, back when you know you, you, you know New York dictated, uh, you know, the the cultural high point and and. Uh, neurotic Jews were unmedicated, and uh, the the, uh, the therapy was was accepted, you know, across the world as 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 being something that is possible and that is done, and, and that neurotic Jews do, and and they talk about it uh, is gone. It's been medicated away. It no longer exists as an archetype. And how? What's your success rate with this stuff? Because you seem to have figured out how to make it work for you. Well, I don't take medicine, so I guess that helps. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I I think I've sort of figured out what I. I like doing on stage and it is sort of short stories, you know? Uh huh. And do you, um, have you, have you tried to take it to people that are not like-minded? Uh, I, I've been venturing out a little bit into, uh, I, I did a thing in Vancouver recently and that was, I was up there. Right. I was there, I think a week before you Uh and it was like a club, it was like a clubby club and it took me a couple days to feel it out and figure out what jokes worked i mean it is there's an attention span that's the difference. biggest issue yeah i mean people who are used to uh short one-liner simple things not i mean i don't i don't mean to demean no 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 yeah. there's nothing demeaning about it but some people you know joke structure is really about turning a phrase or a surprise right. ending. There, there there's nothing like that with me i mean I, I, right yeah so so in order to sort of you know move through something that requires them to to lock in yeah. and follow you 
is, is different. You're, you're really dealing with sophistication and attention span. But if you look at your most one-liners or jokes, what they're waiting for is a surprise ending right. and, or, or a poopy ending. Yeah, and or, I'm, I'm going for a more visceral thing where I'm, I'm trying to tell a story and keep right. people along for the ride. And I, I, I've, been, I've opened a few times for, for Biglia, and uh-huh. I've learned a lot of how, his, how he works, where he really does just try to hit jokes throughout the story. Right. You know, and that's, right. that's, that's something you really have to... So what you do is, what I do and what people who tell stories do is that at some point you have to identify, either consciously or not, this is the laugh place. Yeah. And you can dictate the rest right. of the story. Because I think when you, when you first start with story form, you don't really know where they're going to come. And I'm still like that. There, there are times where I talk about something that's happened recently on stage where people laugh and then, you know, after the show, I got to go like, why'd they laugh there? And then, can yeah. I make it happen again? Right. <laughs> right. And it's like, is it a face I made? Yeah. 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 Right. Right. And, and that's the trickiest part about doing it that way. Yeah. But it's working. I'm trying. I mean, I'm, I'm figuring it out. Things seem to be going all right. Yeah. Yeah. Have, did you do, have you done any television? Uh, I'm wait. I've done like live at Gotham, live that Gotham. Is, essentially, but I'm waiting to do a late night show. Are you on? Uh, are you uh, in line at Fallon show or? Who knows? I don't. I don't really. I'm so. My parents are so freaked out about that part of my life where I don't know. I don't know how things work. I. I, I suppose I am. I know. I've sent tapes in. I've talked to people. But I can tell you honestly, as a guy who's been doing it a long time, uh, the freaked outness will never go away. Yeah, I, and I, I've, I'm fine with that. But my parents, you know, they've been. No, my parents have been so cool about me being a comedian. You know, they, they never pressured me. Yeah. So I think I would be a pretty good trial lawyer. Yeah. You know, and I, they never, because I think well, ultimately, I think my dad wanted to be a comedian. He and all his friends. Which Lawyers is, definitely do. Yeah, that. they just get, they hang out at dinner parties and get bombed and tell war stories. I used you, to you do know. a joke about lawyers are, are creative, charismatic, entertaining people that didn't have the courage to follow their dreams. So now they're going to make everyone else pay for it. Okay, well, I hope my <laughs> parents don't hear that. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, I'm not saying it in, in a negative way that, that most lawyers I've met that go the trial route uh-huh. are, are performers. Oh, and, totally. And, and yeah. many, many people, there's more so than other professions, have left law right. to do stand-up. Yeah. Al Lubell, Greg Giraldo, uh, Mike. Uh, there's, there's been several. Right. Yeah, and there, there is a performance aspect to it. For sure. So your parents are a little more frightened than you are. They are. I mean, they just they just think it's crazy what I'm doing because I they always ask me like, what's the next thing? And I was like, I don't know. I'll figure well, it out. You're a guy. I imagine you know management and uh, you know people who are somehow taking care of your career are trying to move you towards writing. They are. They're they're very uh, very into. I'm a, I'm an ideas guy. Yeah. Say. Yeah.